Ms. Harris. All right, and there were some special instructions to take the vehicle to Print Shack, PAB, across the street of Parker Center. And then they note for us that there are two coffee stains on the hood, disregard not related. Uh, you will have to make the determination of whether that should be disregarded, however, because if this vehicle was uh, properly handled, it's a question of whether or not those coffee stains would even be there. Mr. Harris? After the Bronco had been uh, to the print shed, it was then removed and taken to the impound at a place called Vertels, V-I-E-R-T-E-L-S, uh, the towing yard here in Los Angeles. And you'll see its impound, and you'll see the 94 Ford Bronco again, and again the license number. Mr. Harris? Well, let's see. When they got this Bronco at Vertels, Let's see if they use this same form. The robbery homicide, uh, RHD there, you see. And you see that the check where the prints or evidence or give special care is no longer checked. There's nothing there. Nothing in that location. This will tell you what instructions were given uh, regarding that Bronco as early as June 14, 1994. I think the evidence will show. And the instructions were hold until released to rep from Hertz Corporation. I think there'll be evidence this vehicle was actually uh, owned by the Hertz Corporation. But you'll notice that no special precautions were taken. This vehicle was being held or released to the representative from the Hertz Corporation at that point. Of course, then now we're back to this question then of the integrity of the evidence. And you have the Bronco there going through LAPD Then anything out of the Bronco. Now I'd like to walk over with the course permission to move closer without blocking anyone with the so-called Bronco timeline. Excuse me, please. Mm -hmm. may, may I proceed, John? Thank, Thank you very kind. This is the uh, so-called Bronco timeline. And let's see if we can put this in perspective for you. Uh, There'll be testimony if the LAPD announces that the Rockingham site was, quote, unquote, secured. And there'll be a major question regarding that. That's in June. We know that there was the initial search of the Bronco for blood and trace evidence on June 14th. Then, within a day thereafter, on June 15th, 1994, the vehicle was towed to Vertels. And that's the, the towing yard I just spoke to you about. And that's the uh, place where there was the only indication was hold for release to the Hertz uh, Corporation. And uh, so you can see in June what took place. Now, we know and we expect there will be testimony that as early as June 15th, the day that uh, vehicle, the Bronco, was towed to Vertels, there were documents taken out of the driver's side pouch. We expect there will be testimony from a man by the name of John Meraz, M-E-R-A-Z. Mr. Meraz will indicate that he, they all knew down there this was O.J. Simpson's vehicle, that he got inside that vehicle. And getting inside, he took some receipts or invoices. And I think the evidence will be that some of these receipts or invoices were made out or in the name of the Cole Brown Simpson. So I think you'll find in the course of the evidence that Cole Brown Simpson also drove that vehicle. There will be further evidence that she was in the vehicle, perhaps had gone to the cleaners or some place to pick up some item. But Mr. Meraz will tell you that he took these items out of the driver's side pouch on or about June 15, 1994. He will say that he put those items back in to the Bronco, but the items were then subsequently stolen or taken in another burglary of this particular car that's supposedly secure on Vertel's property. The upshot of it is that today, seven months plus later, we don't have any of those receipts. They've been stolen. They've been taken. They're gone from this supposed secure vehicle in custody of the police or in Vertel. And so this Bronco uh, timeline seeks to spell that out for you. You'll note in going back that we have a smaller picture of the woman touching the Bronco. That's still Wallace at the scene. We know what's happened on the 14th and the 15th. And we move on. Mr. Mraz 
takes the documents initially on the 15th, and I think he says he puts them back almost immediately, uh, within a short period of time. They're kind of like souvenirs, I suppose, if you believe what he tells you. But Vertels does not report the removal of the documents for, to the police and the police commission until July 11, 1994, almost a month later. The official word came out that these documents have been taken and they're missing. And of course, they then start an investigation to try to find out where these documents are. This Brown timeline talks about this whole period of time when we think the evidence will show that the Bronco was improperly stored without the appropriate holds. And then when it was improperly stored, that some bad and unfortunate things happened with evidence having been lost. Now, you'll see, between this period of June 15th, that's the date that the rots got inside when, they, when it was brought to Vertels, and August 26th, did not observe special care rule to preserve the integrity of biological and trace evidence. We think there will be testimony that this vehicle possible this vehicle to, for any number of people to get in and out of that vehicle, and there was not the hole on it that it had in the print shack. Then, lo and behold, on August 26th, between the period of August 26th, 1994, and September 1st, 1994, there was, done by the prosecution, an extensive search of the Bronco for biological and trace evidence. They went back looking for evidence using this trial. You can see, this is for a vehicle that had been towed there on June 15th. So what is that? Two months plus, almost two and a half months, go back. Now they're looking for extensive search for biological and trace evidence. This is a vehicle that we know has been basically improperly stored. There's been at least one burglary or trespass, and maybe two if Mr. Morales is believed. Yet then they then go back seek to get evidence out of there. And this goes into what I've tried to describe for you, a graphic there of the integrity of the evidence, what happens to that evidence, where it goes before it gets to you, and who has had uh, an opportunity to contaminate it or compromise it or in any way corrupt it. That leads us to the point of the, this integrity of evidence being contaminated, compromised, and corrupted. And we think that the, the saga of the Bronco illustrates this concept of the evidence being contaminated, compromised, and corrupted. Thank you. Well, now, with your permission, turn our attention now to this whole concept of a discussion of DNA evidence in the Los Angeles Police Department. I suppose that uh, there's a saying that uh, you have garbage in, you get garbage out. And we have several charts that we think will be illustrative of the, this whole concept of DNA evidence and what it actually means. Mr. Douglas is placing a chart on the board. And uh, Mr. Harris, do you have a laser? <coughs> And we put the black box up because, again, this deals also with the integrity of the evidence. Now, with regard to this particular exhibit, before I get to that, um, Ms. Clark, I want to make a few statements and I'll let you know when we get to that. All right. Nowhere, I think, will you find in this case is the problem of evidence being contaminated, uh, compromised, and corrupted. More important than the area of DNA uh, testing. This is a, the evidence will show is a very new and powerful technology. In the past uh, five years, police departments and crime labs have tried to transfer this DNA test that, they've been, that has been used for research and medical diagnosis and apply it to crime scene samples. We expect that you will hear in the course of the evidence, this transfer of technology has not been simple or easy. And so I want to share with you in the course of my opening statement now some differences between DNA testing for medical purposes and forensic uh, DNA testing on crime scene samples. Remembering as we, in the graphic, that all evidence passes through first the LAPD's hands. If it's compromised when it starts, it's compromised when it comes out. If the evidence was contaminated at the scene or mishandled by the Los Angeles Police Department, it doesn't matter what DNA tests are done afterwards, how many times they're done, or which laboratories did them. 
The results will not be reliable, we expect the evidence to show. Now, to understand the problem of contamination, one must understand, first of all, how small these samples are. And Mr. Douglas has gotten ahead of me just a little bit. DNA. And for illustrative purposes, to illustrate this for you, this is, this is a chart that's titled Small Amounts of DNA from Specks of Blood. Now, what we have is a regular size penny here at the far left. And I want you to be able to compromise or expect that. I want you to be able to compare the regular size penny with 20 nanograms of DNA. And that amounts to you can see very well by pointing to it. Almost like a pen prick. It's 20 nanograms. Much of the evidence in this case, you'll be asked to make decisions regarding, is one tenth of that amount. One tenth of the 20 nanograms are two nanograms, an amount so small that you can't even see it. That's the, what we're trying to demonstrate in this chart again. The penny. 20 nanograms, 2 nanograms, an amount that you could, could not even see with the naked eye. So now that's in that exhibit I was just referring to, Your Honor, was? 207, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Governor. Yeah, that's exhibit 210, Your Honor. We think the evidence will show, in, in including the last chart that was just taken down, that this, these small, minuscule amounts of DNA are very easy to spread around. They can get on your clothes, in your hair, on tweezers, scissors, other tools, move, be moved from one place to the other without anyone seeing or knowing what is happening. The, and this, of course, is how you get contamination. Now, during the course of my remarks today and then last week, and before that, the remarks of the prosecutors, we've all stood at this particular podium. If I sneezed, or if any saliva came out, or if I scratched my hair and any dandruff was there, or if I touched this and had any blood on my finger or a splinter there, if Ms. Clark did likewise, if Mr. Darden did likewise, then our DNA would be on this area. And if I took a handkerchief out, and wipe this, such as they do in labs, that would pick up the various DNA that's here. You can't see it. That's how small it is under these circumstances. So that gives you an idea. If we were to wipe it across here, a handkerchief, it could now be taken to the lab and allegedly tested. In fact, some medical labs, as I said, do in fact do this, uh, and it's done in the lab uh, in a scene in, to determine whether or not there's any contamination. That's how they test it to see if there's contamination. If you're trying to test to see if someone is going to be able to be compatible for a particular organ transplant, they check to see because you can't see this. Now, as I gave the example, if I had been the only one here, you might expect to find only my DNA. But if Mr. Darden and Ms. Clark were here, you might expect to find their DNA. If Mr. Van Adder here sneezed, you might find his DNA. So there's all kinds of ways in which we have this possible contamination. And one of the problems with the test is that it cannot tell one person's DNA from another. This is what we call, and I think the evidence will be, a mixed sample. There's a great controversy we think the evidence will show about whether small mixed samples can be tested reliably, even if everything else is done properly and there is no con contamination. So if you had contamination to it, then you can see what the problems are. Now, to give you a perspective now, right. this is this board that I'm now going to refer to is the so-called DNA testing technology transfer board. What we want to demonstrate here, as you recall, I said that over the course of the last five years, what we're trying to do here is to transfer uh, from meta what we use in medical research uh, and to exclude suspects primarily to the field, to forensics, to crime scenes, to try and make it work in that setting. 
This is, as I indicated to you last week, cyberspace or 21st century technology. And I think you will find the evidence will be that the collection procedures are 19th century or covered wagon collection procedures. And that why, that's why it's such a problem. And so if you looked at uh, this medical research area, generally you could expect that in the medical field that there are uh, clean samples, more than likely in a, in a clean medical lab. The blood is carefully taken under antiseptic conditions in hospitals. And in a forensic setting, DNA testing is done by definition generally. At dirty samples are taken from crime scenes, from sidewalk, from carpets. And they're exposed to all sort of contamination. That there are many different sources. That they, these are, as you know already, these are minute specks of blood. There may be saliva. It may be skin, uh, cells, dandruff, as I indicated to you, even a spray of a sneeze can contaminate the forensic sample. So what I want to do in this example, we have these charts here, is that in comparing the medical research, we're going to compare the medical research with the forensic and see which one is more likely to be uh, reliable under the circumstances. Well, I think that we can... The evidence will show that as opposed to the clean samples and the dirty samples, in this instance, the clean sample in the medical lab would be far more reliable than something you rely upon. The next area we'll be talking about is in a, generally in a medical lab, you have a general sample size. The doctor can have whatever sample size he usually wants or, can, or, or needs. Uh, in forensics, the samples come generally in very, very limited, minute amounts. When working with such small amounts, often the test can only be done once. And of course, we think the evidence will show that is, uh, it's harder to produce reliable results under those circumstances. In fact, you will hear, we think in this case, that most of the important DNA tests performed by the prosecution were done with amounts of DNA that were actually below the preferred amounts for reliable testing. So if you talk about the medical research labs having a general sample size, and in the forensic area having minuscule sample size, again, you can see there is a higher risk of contamination in the minuscule sample size. And that brings us down to the unmixed samples from known sources. As you know, and Ms. Clark alluded to this in her statement, in a medical setting, you have people that you know. If you have a lady who's going to have amniocentesis, you know who that is. You have someone who's going to give, one person's going to give somebody else uh, a kidney, you know who they are. So you have uh, known sources that you're dealing with. And that makes a big difference, as I think you'll see during the course of the testimony. In medical testing, we take these unmixed samples from known persons. In forensics, we use and collect samples that could be mixtures in varying amounts from a number of unknown people. Because you don't know who's been out there, who's walked, who's sneezed, who's bled who scratched their head. Uh, you don't know over a period of time. We expect that you'll hear, uh, again in this area, that the new forms of DNA testing used by the prosecution in this case not, are just not reliable enough to use when analyzing mixtures from unknown sources. And the key thing here being mixed samples from unknown sources. So again, once again on forensics, the higher risk of contamination. Then in the lab, in the medical research area, there is generally minimal handling. Uh, this is fairly clear and, and straightforward. There's less handling than in the scene when you have someone going out trying to collect something. Uh, contrary, as I said, to what the prosecutor told you last week, the evidence will be it's not as simple as wiping up a spill uh, in your kitchen. This, this, this technology is so sensitive. It's not that, uh, that simple at all. You and I just shouldn't go out and do this. We can do it. We want to use the same techniques they're using with the LAPD but you get results that are all uh, unreliable. So with, between minimal handling and multiple handling, you can see again, there's a higher risk of contamination with the multiple handling. Error rates, better known. And that's because, I think you hear testimony, that in the medical labs, they subject their results and things to tests. You mentioned, I mentioned the wipe tests. In labs, they do that because they're concerned about contamination in the labs when you go to the doctor. You want to have the doctor make sure his lab is contamination-free as near as possible. It brings about confidence, and that's what we've done a whole industry based upon. Transferring this technology to the forensics area, the error rates are nearly, are not nearly, as well known as I think you can see. So again, 
is a higher risk of contamination and error. In this area also. I think you'll find that in the course of the testimony that the labs have a higher standard for doing DNA testing in metal lab, medical laboratories. They're much stricter on themselves than the standards that forensics and the police departments and laboratories are using. And so you can see how important it is. In one case, when you're talking about these high standards, you're concerned about whether or not your organs will be compatible if you want to have an organ transfer or whatever. And the other, you're concerned about somebody's freedom their virtual life. And so we're going to see whether or not, uh, under this scenario, whether or not there aren't higher clinical lab standards when you're concerned about somebody at the hospital than you are when somebody's on trial for their very life. And given that, lower lab standards and the lack of testing, and again in this area, in forensics, there's a higher risk of contamination and error. I mentioned this earlier, but in the labs, there is this rigorous proficiency testing. And of course, I think you'll find the testimony will be that uh, in forensics, uh, very rarely do they do any blind testing, uh, no outside agencies. They give themselves easy tests and almost never take blind external proficiency tests. And that has a real bearing on the overall proficiency here. And so again, I think you'll find it's a higher risk of contamination and error in the forensics area, again. And finally, with regard to statistical controversy in this area, in medical testing, usually you're just trying to see if someone has inherited a copy of, of a disease gene from their parent or whatever, has the correct genetic types for transplantation, transplantation of an organ, or has been infected with a harmful bacteria or virus. That's what you're looking for. And there's no elaborate statistical estimates uh, are needed to get reliable test results for that. In forensics, we think you'll hear testimony that there is a bitter and complicated statistical controversy regarding this entire area, DNA, and specifically PCR, about a DNA match and what a match means. And while we're about it, I think the evidence will show when you hear the prosecutor talking about it's a match, it's a match, it's a match. What she really means to say is that it's, a, it's consistent with, these are not fingerprints consistent with someone else's genotype or with their blood type. So with regard to this whole area of statistical controversy, again, the forensics area, the higher risk of contamination error in this area. So if you look at this, this chart, you look at blood on both sides of that, you can see clearly, and I expect the evidence to be, that because of the dirty samples, the minuscule sample size, the mixed samples from unknown sources, the multiple handling, the error rates not well known, the low lab standards, the easy proficiency testing, and the major statistical controversy. And in all those areas, the, seek the seeking to transfer this technology to forensics is fraught with all kinds of problems, and there is a much higher risk of contamination and error. Now, we expect that during this hearing you will hear some astronomical numbers presented regarding the DNA test results. And uh, these numbers are part of the, what I was telling you, the statistical controversy, whether or not these are accepted in the science. And these numbers also only address gene frequencies. These are not fingerprints. And the numbers that you will hear, if you hear them in this case, have nothing to do with the issue of contamination that we've been talking about. They do not have anything to do with the issue of laboratory errors. They don't have anything to do with the issue of tampering, whether the sample was tampered with. And they have nothing to do with other important DNA issues which you'll hear about in the course of this case. Specifically under the DNA testing aspect, we think that you'll hear testimony in this case about polymerase chain reaction, the so-called PCR testing. And I think you'll find out in here that the very best medical and research labs that do PCR have contamination problems. And as I mentioned to you last week, I think that you'll hear that this is an area uh, that presents a real problem. We expect during the course of our evidence in this case to show that from their own studies, the LAPD's laboratory 
is a cesspool of contamination. Looking at their own records and the tests they've run, we will demonstrate for you what those records show. We expect then in this entire area, and the evidence will show that this, the careless, slipshod, negligent collection, handling, and processing of samples by basically poorly trained personnel from LAPD has contaminated, compromised, and corrupted the DNA evidence in this case. And Your Honor, that might be a good spot. Should we go further? All right. Thank you, Counsel. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to uh, take our recess for the uh, noon hour. Please remember my admonition to you. Do not discuss this case amongst yourselves. Form any opinions about the case. Don't allow anybody to talk to you about the case. And you are not to perform any deliberations on the case until the matter has been submitted to you after the completion of the case. And we will resume again at 1.30. All right, we'll stand in recess. Thank you, Counsel. young trial lawyer in Pasadena, I recall, trying a case in Judge Ladig's courtroom, being late in a jury trial, and Judge Ladig had the jury out sitting in the box as I walked in late from lunch. And he never said anything to me, but I got the message. It's happened to me, Your Honor. I, I apologize. We had a late meeting, which delayed lunch considerably, and I didn't expect it to take as long as it did. Well, keep that experience in mind. All right, counsel, uh, let me uh, bring up one matter before we invite the jurors to rejoin us for the uh, continuation of Mr. Cochran's uh, opening statements. Uh, counsel, when you use a videotape or an audio tape during the course of the uh, opening statements or any time during the, the course of the trial, then there's a transcript that's available. Uh, I forgot to ask you for the normal stipulation that the court reporter need not attempt to take down what is on the video or audio tape at that time. And Mr. Uh, Cochran, you did use a, that videotape during the course of your opening statement. Is that okay. stipulation agreeable to you? Yes, I won't be so stipulated. Yes, I'm so stipulated. All right. Thank you, counsel. All right, Deputy Magnaron, let's have the jury, please. All right, counsel, please be seated. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right, Mr. Cochran, do you wish to continue your opening remarks? Yes, I do, Your Honor. Thank you very kindly. Thank you, counsel. Game. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I can make a promise to you this time that I will finish this opening statement this afternoon, barring any unforeseen calamities. We'll be finished this afternoon with the opening statement. Thank you for your patience and ask you again to keep an open mind. Um, just before we um, concluded lunch, we were talking about uh, the importance of DNA and we still have some more DNA to talk about. I have two charts now I want to discuss with you briefly. They're labeled, uh, for the record, PCR amplification charts. And we're seeking to explain how this concept works, the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, this technology I've been talking to you about as a facet of DNA, a technology. PCR tests um, take these very, very small samples that we've been talking about, and now you've seen some of which you cannot even see, and they are amplified up, kind of a molecular Xeroxing, if you will. And that's what we're trying to demonstrate here. We expect the evidence to show and that, um, that scientists are not yet able to actually examine the small amount of DNA contained in minute specks of blood. They must first amplify the DNA so there's enough of it to examine. Amplification or amplifying DNA, as I said, is like molecular Xeroxing. You start with a small amount of DNA and they go through these various cycles. Each cycle doubles the amount of uh, DNA and they do this 32 times, the evidence will be, before they have enough DNA to examine. Now this uh, first chart shows what happens when you have a single piece of DNA that is then amplified or doubled 32 times. And then it goes from this one fragment that you may not have been able to even see to over 4 billion fragments as is indicated on the particular chart. Now, that is the molecular Xeroxing uh, made as, hopefully, as clear as uh, we can make it in line with what we expect the testimony to, to be. Mr. Douglas, we move. What's the number of that chart, Mr. Douglas? Now, referring and directing your attention to number 209, which is the amplification of four fragments. Now, this chart seeks to illustrate for you what happens when there may be a mixture of DNA in the sample. We're just talking about mixtures and heard me this morning talk about the wipe test with a handkerchief on this particular podium. This chart shows four different fragments of DNA at the start. And after this mixture, just like we did in the previous chart, is amplified up, there will now be over, the bottom should be 16 billion or 17 billion fragments. Extra fragments of DNA, the evidence will show, could get into the sample in any number of ways. And that's one of the vices of this particular system and its reliability. From someone coughing on the evidence, from flecks of blood which may come from one sample and be passed on to another sample, from specks of blood that stick to a pair of tweezers, if the technician is using those, or scissors, from someone shedding dead skin cells onto the evidence, from dandruff, from any number of things. So the problem comes when one seeks to, when one has more than one sample and the amplification gets into the, the billions. We still have the same problem uh, as you look at that. These charts, we expect to have testimony from the experts to address these charts. And we hopefully use these today to make this process a little clearer to you of how the PCR is amplified up, try and get some results. And even when you get the results, as I indicated this morning, a match doesn't mean like a fingerprint. It means consistent width generally. And there can be the, when the contamination gets in there, then you can't tell one person's DNA from the other. And uh, we can move on to the next chart. Then. Now, in this case, to try and conclude our discussion of DNA so everybody can wake up again and be alive again, this, uh, you've heard a lot about DNA, and you hear a lot about DNA evidence. Prosecution will undoubtedly present uh, some of these technicians uh, who come in from the crime lab who perform the various tests. And you'll recall 
that on this particular high-profile case, they designated as the officer in charge a Ms. Mazzola, who's a trainee. Which this was only her third crime scene. She was supervised by a Mr. Fung, uh, who was a supervisor that day. And we expect their technicians will come in, tell you what they did, the various tests they conducted, and the conclusions which they have drawn from um, the tests. We expect to present uh, testimony, however, somewhat contrary, including uh, some of the people I've told you about earlier. And we expect that the people we call will tell you, based upon their observation and their knowledge of the field, which of these test results are reliable and which ones aren't, given what the technicians will tell you that they did. Now, in summary, with regard to the DNA, we will look at each item, hopefully have testimony regarding each item, hopefully have some testimony regarding which items are reliable or not reliable, and then make, uh, give you evidence by which you can make a final decision. You'll recall, I believe, that um, Ms. Clark in her opening statement said that um, blood consistent with Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman was found on the glove that this Detective Furman we talked about claims to have found behind Mr. Simpson's home. That glove will be undoubtedly, the evidence will show, one of the most hotly disputed items in this case. Where the glove was, how it got there, where it came from, will be very important issues. In addition to that, there will be a major dispute in certain other areas. I think you'll hear a lot of testimony about the so-called blood found in the Bronco. You remember the Bronco timeline. You'll hear a lot of testimony about uh, whether or not uh, the prosecution contention that blood consistent with, not their blood, but consistent with Goldman and Nicole uh, found inside Nicole Brown Simpson, inside the Bronco, whether or not this finding is trustworthy. Uh, we expect the evidence will show uh, and that the police technicians would used unreliable procedures in collecting this. They made fundamental er errors in conducting these tests, and then they misinterpreted their own findings, as I've indicated to you earlier. That uh, the stains that they think are consistent with Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson contain tiny amounts of DNA, so little can barely be detected. And this DNA could only be found using this super sensitive procedure we've talked about. Uh, where even a sneeze could contaminate it. So even if the test results were right, we think the evidence will show, the DNA could be from a tiny amount of contaminating DNA from the crime scene from another person. Finally, in that connection, we think the evidence will show that the DNA results that supposedly put Cole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman in the Bronco are not like a fingerprint, and a match doesn't mean that. They detect characteristics in the DNA that millions of people have not characteristics that are unique to one particular person. Now, let's talk about something other than DNA for a moment. When Mr. Simpson came back from Chicago, you think the evidence will be that he came home immediately, came back voluntarily after hearing about his ex-wife's death? You have heard some indication about his demeanor on his way back, that he went, came home, that he was asked by the police to come downtown, that he went downtown, that, without giving you what the statement was, that he cooperated fully and that he gave the police a statement, perhaps some 33 minutes, which statement is tape recorded, that the two detectives who interviewed him at the time were Detectives Lang and Van Adder. He answered all their questions. Conclusion of that interview, they asked for a blood sample. Mr. Simpson was only too pleased or cooperative to go and give a blood sample at that time. And if I might step over a little closer, this next chart, and uh, Mr. Douglas, what is this chart? This chart. Hopefully, it will graphically illustrate what took place. Referring to number 205, we have Parker Center. This is the Los Angeles Police Department headquarters down at 150 North Los Angeles. This is the building in which Mr. Simpson gave this statement to the two lead detectives from robbery homicide. They questioned him and he answered their questions. Thereafter, and that's the building depicted, that's the little yellow circle depicted there. 
Thereafter, we asked Mr. Simpson to give some blood. The technician then drew some blood from his arm. <coughs> we think, according to the testimony, it was approximately eight milliliters of blood. What the testimony was in between 7.9 and 8.1, which I think is eight milliliters of blood. Now, we think the evidence will show under normal police procedures, they've been following their own procedures, when the detectives had this blood in a vial, certainly Mr. Simpson's blood at that time, they would have taken it over about a three minute or very short drive and book it at a place called Piper Tech. If your evidence about where they book this kind of evidence, where the refrigerators are and that sort of thing. To book it, to preserve it, you hear the importance of preserving that blood. We think the evidence in this case will show that the detectives didn't take the blood from Simpson at about 2.30 on, on June 13, 1994. They didn't go this very short distance to Piper Tech and book it. For some reason, they came all the way, I guess this is some 20 miles or so, from downtown LA with the blood on their person in this vial, came all the way out here to this area called Brentwood, the home of O.J. Simpson, 360 North Rockingham Avenue. And we think the evidence will show that Detective Van Adder, who had this blood on his person, instead of booking it in Piper Tech where it should have been, carried this blood around from 2.30 till perhaps 5.20 in the afternoon on, Jan on June 13th, 1994. Went back to O.J. Simpson's home. And there, we expect there'll be some testimony, that blood vial he'd been carrying around apparently in his pocket. He then turned over to Mr. Fung, who was the supervisor of this officer in charge, the trainee at the scene. And then you will hear some interesting testimony about what happens to that blood. It's the blood is supposed to be number 17, but it gets booked as number 18 at some point. Number 18 you're going to find is a pair of sneakers that same afternoon at Rockingham, we think you'll hear testimony that Detective Van Adder's partner, Detective Lang, been with the LAPD some 25, 27 years, uh, talks to Mr. Simpson after Mr. Simpson comes back home. And they ask him, what shoes were you wearing last night? Words to that effect. And they pick up a pair of Reebok tennis shoes. And I think you'll find that's consistent with what Cato Kalin had said he was wearing, I think, when he goes to McDonald's to get the hamburger. They, they then take these tennis shoes. Tennis shoes are ultimately booked as number 18. But for a while, at least, the blood is also number 18. Detective Lang, I think, will testify that he takes these tennis shoes, he takes them home for the night. He doesn't go back downtown and book them or whatever. He takes them home and brings them back the next day, which would be the 14th. So there's this mislabeling, this confusion, as to what happens with this blood and who gets it. We know that the next morning, Fung has the blood downtown, and, and Colin Yamauchi, one of the technicians, takes one milliliter of blood out of this particular vial. So this blood, this is the strange saga of this blood and why it was carried out here. We expect the evidence will show exactly the events I've just testified to you, or just told you about in testimony. Mr. Douglas? Next, Your Honor, is Exhibit 211. Now, with regard to Exhibit 211, <clears throat> this exhibit seeks to demonstrate for you, as best we can, using the prosecution's records. Or we can use the records. These are their records. If this is wrong, maybe because the records are wrong. But the defendant's sample offered voluntarily. We've told you that. That's a Mr. Simpson's blood. I've already shared with you that you have eight milliliters taken on June 13th. We know that uh, the detective walks around with it for these three hours or so before the technician ever gets it. <clears throat> According to the records as we understand, so you start with the eight milliliters. We know that on June 14th, we think there'll be testimony, that Colin Yamauchi took from Fung one milliliter of Mr. Simpson's blood. You have to, we'll have to subtract that at some point. We know that seven days later, Mr. Flaherty 
took 1.5 milliliters in a tube. It's a smaller tube, as indicated here. Ultimately, you turn 8 milliliters from this tube. So we know there was 0.7 milliliters used out of the smaller tube that had been taken on the 21st. Then on June 25th, Kolon Yamauchi again put some blood on some threads for some purpose, and he used only 0.05 milliliters at that point, according to our understanding of their evidence. Then on June 27th, Mr. Matheson, again another one of the technicians, took 0.75 milliliters of Mr. Simpson's blood, all from the same tube. And finally, the defense at some point were given one milliliter of the blood. And we know that um, there's some blood left in the small tube. And we know that in a recent measurement in January, I think on or about January 4th of this year, there was 1.8 milliliters left in the tube, plus the 8 milliliters returned from this, the smaller tube. And if you subtract these particular figures, and I've done that, you subtract the 1.0, the 0.7, the 0.05, the 0.75, the 1.0, you will have 3.50 milliliters of blood taken. To that, you have to add the 1.8 left and the 0.8 that was used there are 2.60. So if you add the 2.60 to the 3.50, you will get 6.10 milliliters of blood. And so this chart, perhaps maybe it'll be explained to us during the trial, shows that if you started with 8.0 milliliters and you use 6.10 milliliters, there would be then 1.9 milliliters missing above the amount that's left, 1.90 missing. And one of the things we'll be looking at in this case is what happened to that missing blood, and where is it? Now, perhaps there are some records we haven't seen that will explain that. But those are the records as we understand it, that there would be 1.90 milliliters of missing blood uh, in that connection. A bit more about this crime scene and what happened. Uh, we think you will see and hear from this um, trainee, Mazzola, what she did at that scene, how she sought to collect these samples, uh, Detective Fung's role at both Bundy and at both Rockingham. We think that you'll be able to then make a determination about what took place out there on that date. Now, one of the other key bits of evidence we expect in this case will be these socks that Miss. Clark talked to, talked to you about in her opening statement. You remember she talked about the socks? And I think that um, with regard to the socks, I believe we have a timeline and we also have a, a graphic with regard to the socks also. May we have the graphic and the number of the graphic? Okay. All right. D84, thank you. Uh, you'll recall there was some testimony about this. I think there'll be testimony during the course of this case that this is uh, the master bedroom in Mr. O.J. Simpson's home in Rockingham. There'll be testimony this place is usually meticulous and spotless. You'll note that the carpet is very, very light. And I think there'll be testimony the carpet is either white or very light um, throughout, going up the stairways and in the hallways and various other places. And you'll recall that in this picture, you'll notice that whatever this strap is on the bed is hanging down on the bed. I think there's another picture where that strap has been moved. And over in the center, and you'll see in this picture, the second picture, Mr. Harris, what is this? In this picture, you don't see the strap hanging down, so apparently it's been moved. You will see a view of these socks. These socks apparently bald, kind of part of them rolled up, and then the in this, on this carpet, a rug that's at the foot of Mr. Simpson's bed and just uh, in front of the fireplace. The only item you find there. Here's a close-up view of these socks 
which were located there. And this now is June 13th, uh, the afternoon hours at the Rockingham residence. These socks are located. Now, the timeline, I think, is helpful to us as we consider and look at these socks. Again, these socks recovered on June 13th. Just talked about that. And they're examined on June 13th. And there's no mention of blood on these socks on June 13th. We know that Michelle Kessler, basically the, the supervisor of the lab over there at LAPD, uh, shows these socks, uh, they can't really examine them, to two of our experts, Drs. Michael Baden and Dr. Barbara Wolf. They see the socks on June 24th. That's within 11 days of the socks having been taken back to the lab. It's June 24th. Around this same time, I think also in June, Ms. Michelle Kessler, I think, makes some observations of these socks and at some point sees some fiber or something on the socks. So there's an opportunity, I believe the evidence will show, to, to look at these socks and have been able to observe them on more than one occasion. Then we think that on June 29th, 1994, the evidence will show that Kessler, Matheson, and Yamauchi do, in fact, inspect the socks. There's a third date in the, in the saga of the socks. It's not until August 4th, 1994, that anybody in the LAPD lab sees a blood stain on these socks for the first time. Now, these are the same socks that you see up here picked up on June 13th, been seen on the 13th, seen on the 24th, seen on the 29th, but yet it's August 4th before a blood stain is seen on these socks for the first time. And that's not all. We think the evidence will show that on or about September 22nd, 1994, there was, without testing any, blamed anyone, a false leak to the press that Nicole Brown Simpson's DNA had been found on one of these socks. The problem with that false leak was that no DNA test had yet been performed. So they had predicted the results before the socks had ever been tested for DNA. They were still, in fact, at the LAPD lab, but they don't have the capacity to do this. Then the socks after that leak, on the 22nd, I believe, and that leak was uh, by a local Channel 4 reporter who then reconfirmed that leak the next day about Cole Brown Simpson's DNA on these socks. The socks then were not even sent out for DNA testing until September 26, some four days later. And then, of course, lo and behold, on November 17, 1994, the lab reports they find DNA on the socks, Cole Brown Simpson's DNA on the socks, just as they had predicted in this false leak back September 22nd. And, of course, these are the same socks where nobody saw any blood at all until August 4th. And that's not all with regard to these socks. You will hear that throughout, there are very, very small amounts of these nanograms which you saw on the chart, on the evidence in this case. The, the, the nanograms found on these socks is more than 1,400 nanograms, which is as much as all the other blood tested in this entire case just on these socks. And so, we think this will be, the evidence will be, this will be a hotly contested item as to whether or not these socks were consciously, intentionally tampered with in an effort, in a rush to judgment, to get evidence on Mr. Simpson, where you have the results predicted before the socks are ever sent out to the lab. And the amount of this DNA being equal to the amount of all the rest of the blood found in this particular case. I think the evidence will show that in addition to this, you can see this area is very, very, very light around here. There's no blood uh, found on this carpet or on that rug that's at the foot of his bed. That There's no blood found on the light carpet on the stairs and the hallway floor on the way up. Because the court has indicated, I believe, that we'll have a jury view in this case, you'll be able to see for yourself, hopefully, at some time in the near future, this particular area, you can see for yourself exactly how it looks and what took place. 
I should point out that the LAPD did, in fact, do some serology on these stocks at some time, uh, but they did not have the capacity to do the DNA that was predicted. So we think this will be something that you will find of, of some great amount of interest and it will be a major uh, item litigated during the course of this particular hearing. I mentioned to you earlier as we leave the Sox and what took place, that I wanted to briefly compare with you the conduct of O.J. Simpson with the conduct of the officers, the LAPD officers involved in this case for this general area of, of June 13th. Let's take, first of all, Mr. Simpson. You expect the evidence to show that Mr. Simpson's in Chicago on a prearranged, long-standing trip for Hertz to play golf. But he gets a call from Detective Phillips in the early morning hours that his whole demeanor and everything changed, of course, and he comes back voluntarily. And when he gets back, he comes home. And he meets with the detectives. They ask him to come downtown. He goes downtown and he meets with the detectives without any counsel. That he talks with them. That he gives them blood. Does everything they ask of him. That he then comes back to home, back home that afternoon, June 13th, in the afternoon. Now, meanwhile, the detectives, we'll start with Detective Phillips, delayed, it's almost 10 hours before they get the coroner out there. And we've already talked about the ramifications of that and tried to establish this man's innocence. They then go from the Bundy crime scene to Rockingham, all four of them, as you know, and climb over the wall, and they make these misrepresentations to the judge. So in their very first contact with the criminal justice system at 1045 on June 13th, they don't tell the truth, the evidence will show. Because first of all, they know he's on a trip that was planned, and they say an unexpected trip. We've shown you those, those three items earlier. They don't tell the judge how they get over the wall or whatever. So these are the things they, they put in a declaration, which you've previously seen already that day. They continue looking around, they mass and find evidence. We've talked already about how people at, boat, at the scene, certainly at Bundy, are traipsing through the evidence and that sort of thing. They, later that day, after making contact with Mr. Simpson, are at his home. They go back downtown with him. They question him. They take his blood. Instead of taking his blood and booking it like they should have for their own procedures, they take that blood and come some 20 miles or so west, back to Rockingham, carry it around, seize his tennis shoes, don't book those until the next day, mislabel. The blood is to be 17. They label it 18. The tennis shoes or the sneakers are 18. And these are the experienced detectives in this case. When you look at this case, as the case progresses, we want you to characterize how they conducted themselves and how O.J. Simpson conducted himself in making a judgment in this case about whether or not the prosecution will ever prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. There will be a number of key witnesses in the case without getting into any of them. All witnesses are important. I think all sides would agree that no side has a priority on the truth, priority on the truth. All witnesses should be accorded, as the court has uh, instructed you in looking uh, at how you determine the truthfulness of a witness. Uh, you should do that. There are other miscellaneous points that I'd like to make at this point with regard, one of which is with the 911 tape. Uh, the tape I have in mind now is the one from October 25th, 1993. I believe you heard testimony that one of the officers who came out at that particular time, and this is the time when uh, many of you said uh, during voir dire you'd heard this particular tape, when there's no physical injury or whatever, there's a door damage, which is already damaged, which is damaged some more. Mr. Simpson agrees to fix that door. You'll hear what's on that tape with regard to what Mr. Simpson has to say and what Mrs. Simpson has to say about her intent and her thought. But I think what you'll find, the evidence will show that this argument, the entire argument on October 25th, 1993, was over picture frames of former lo lovers 
our lovers while they were away and separated from each other, not having been removed or taken out of the house as they were striving to get back together, as you know, during the, the latter part of 1993. In another area, in listening to the prosecution's opening statement, there was certainly a suggestion there may be some connection between the noises, these thumps on the wall, if you will, that were heard by Mr. Cato Kalin somewhere around 1047 in the evening, and someone presumably climbing over the fence, there's testimony, I think there's a fence back there near Cato's room, and accidentally dropping the glove where Detective Furman claims that he finds that glove, of course, later on in the morning. Keep in mind that there will be, we expect, testimony from Rosa Lopez about the fact that there are people and voices over in the Simpson compound, 12 o'clock on till about 3 o'clock, that she hears. It's not O.J. Simpson's voice out there. She hears people talking. She can't go to sleep, she says. We think the evidence will show that this, this walkway, which is very, very narrow, is very, very near where she lives, kind of in her housekeeper quarters in the house right next door, we expect the evidence to be, that the area where Detective Furman claims that he found this particular glove is an area that has a number of cobwebs and things back there, which one might infer that people hadn't been walking back there, hadn't been back there for a while. I think the evidence will also show that on that side of Mr. Simpson's home, Mr. Simpson had wanted to come home and hide himself from anybody outside, a limousine driver. There are at least two entrances to his house on that side. There's one door the evidence will show that goes into a laundry room, and of course there's a door into the garage, all on this side of the house. I make these statements because I think this is what the evidence will show in response to what the prosecution has indicated. I think you'll also find that there will be testimony there was there is a, a great amount of very thick shrubbery at the top of that fence that separates the property where Ms. Lopez lives, where Mr. Simpson lives on that day. And I think you'll hear testimony as to whether or not any of those twigs, leaves, or any of those items were ever disturbed or appeared to be disturbed as though anybody had climbed across, or climbed over that fence. Now, we want to turn our attention to something I alluded to the last time. We call it the timeline. One of the things that we expect to show during the course of this trial is not only did Mr. Simpson not commit these brutal murders, but he did not, would not, could not, of uh, the time frame, have committed these particular killings under the witnesses that both sides know about and we understand. And what we have is a timeline with a chart and a timeline with the graphics, which we'd like to uh, call to your attention now. So what's the number of that? That is D87. D87? And D87, so that you're clear, this is the Simpson compound. This is the home on Rockingham that you've heard a lot about. This street over here is the, act can I get that back? Thank you, Mr. Harris, sir. This street over here is the Ashford Street, where ultimately Allen Park will come. This street over here is the Rockingham Gate, where the Bronco will be parked. There's a gate right here, and the Bronco is parked right there. Remember, the, we indicated there will be testimony about when the Bronco comes out, uh, how it, it's a sharp turn right to that location. And over here, there will be testimony that Cato Kalin's vehicle is parked. And in some of the subsequent photographs, I believe we'll see that his vehicle is parked here on Ashford also. Thank you, Mr. Harris. And this is the Bundy residence of, of Nicole Brown Simpson, and I believe that 875 Bundy is right there. This is the walkway that Detective Phillips talked about, right up in that way. A lot of shrubbery, and there's a gate there. The testimony was, you recall, or a statement was, you can see the bodies from the street. The gate was open. I think you saw some pictures from the prosecutors within their opening statement. This is Bundy, and Bundy in, in uh, this area is a street that um, traverses north and south, north being this way, south being that way, west being here at the top, as I understand it, and this is the area here where these bodies were found. This is Nicole Brown Simpson's residence. It's the residence which she had purchased 
You recall with the funds that uh, she'd gotten from the money that Mr. Simpson had given him before he married, and there's some additional funds that he'd given her. She had moved there voluntarily. You heard the, the approximate distance between the two. 